pertains to um, the mystery of the beast, okay, a.k.a. the Antichrist. All right, so we're going to be looking at that topic tonight. So let's go to Revelation chapter 13, where we find the description of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, let's stand for the reading of the text. This is John writing. He said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage which you've included in the book of Revelation. Lord, a sometimes misunderstood, miscalculated book. But God, I pray that it would be revealed and unveiled before our eyes. May we have a clearer understanding of this passage uh, by the time we are through with our few minutes this evening that you will give us. Bless our time, we pray in Christ's name. All God's people say amen. You can be seated tonight. Trust you received a worksheet uh, so you can take a few notes and follow along. Hey, man, hopefully you won't be sleeping on me. All right. So as uh, we've come to this final book, I want you to note the first point I've included for you is the fact that it's the first and only book of prophecy in the New Testament. All right, the first and only book of prophecy in the New Testament. The author is believed to be the Apostle John. Uh, We believe he penned it somewhere around A.D. 95, 96, at the time being about 90 years of age, while he was exiled to the island of Patmos or Potmos, however you want to pronounce it. But I'm going to use Patmos for tonight. The island of Patmos was uh, located, when I began to look at its geographic location, um, it's located in the Aegean Sea. It's one of the Greek islands uh, located about 24 miles west of Asia Minor. Now, uh, it's a small island, uh, 10 miles long, 6 miles wide, used at that time for political prisoners, enemies of the state. Okay, were placed there to work for the rest of their lives in hard labor in the salt mines, okay, that were there. And that's what uh, happened to John. Only, no doubt, the mercy of God that he uh, was able to be released. It seems that he was released sometime later from that island and then went to live out the rest of his days near Ephesus. Okay, now at the time of Revelation, we know from church history 
the church was being intensely persecuted uh, by the Romans. For several decades, Christianity had remained unnoticed, in a sense, by the Roman government because they had regarded it at first as a part of the Jewish religion. Okay? Uh, but soon it was discovered and determined that it wasn't, okay, um, part of the Jewish religion. So as soon as they found that out and it reached the emperor, Christianity was outlawed and illegal, okay? Strong external evidence uh, seems to indicate that Revelation was written during the reign of the emperor Domitian, uh, who was emperor from about 81 to 96 A.D. Domitian was the emperor of who it's been said he, quote, bathed his empire in the blood of the Christians. Uh, So thus we find John and many others becoming the target of his persecution. But I like the fact that God sustained John in spite of the persecution. Why? Because God wasn't finished with him yet. Amen? And God had a large assignment for him to complete, that being the book that's before us this evening. Now, the word revelation is from a Greek word meaning to uncover, to unveil. The key message of the book of Revelation, and I like this. I could just stop right here and we could have camp meeting. The key message of the book of Revelation is that Satan and the world cannot win. But Christ and the church cannot lose. Isn't that good news? Satan and the world cannot win. And Christ and the church cannot lose. So the, ver- the key verse of Revelation is the first verse, Revelation 1.1, which reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, many folks avoid the book of Revelation, saying it's just too confusing, perhaps frightening. But to avoid the book is to miss out on a pronounced blessing. Yes, Revelation can be very difficult and sometimes misunderstood. But if we ignore it, we will miss the glory of of Christ and his triumphing over the Antichrist, the beast, and the dragon. I don't want to miss that. Hello, church. Many times Revelation seems strange to us as readers if we don't have a good handle or understanding on the rest of Scripture. But if we become acquainted, okay, here's a key point. Notice this. You might want to jot it down. If you become acquainted with the Old Testament idioms, okay, you will then discover some jewels buried within the text of the book of Revelation. Every sign, every symbol, every type, every structure, every graph that is uh, shown or displayed in the book of Revelation has its explanation and definition somewhere else in God's Word and in the Old Testament in particular. That's why I have this statement. Out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, there are some 278 allusions to the Old Testament. So, okay, so if you want to be a student of Revelation, you've got to be a student of the Old Testament. Okay, so uh, what's the sister book in the Old Testament to the book of Revelation, which always should be studied together? Anybody want to holler it out? Daniel, absolutely. Daniel and Revelation. So Revelation, notice on your worksheet, is a lens through which the rest of the Bible is focused. Okay, the entire Bible is written in anticipation of this final and, can I say, climatic book 
All right? So even though Revelation is perhaps the most controversial book in Scripture and can become a subject of a lot of wild speculation, as believers, we should familiarize ourselves with its content. The book is meant to be understand. That's why it's called Revelation, to reveal. Okay? It even states in chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth. That's the, I believe this is the only book in the Bible that places a blessing on those that read it, that is stated. Blessed is he that readeth and that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. So in effect, the book itself says, hey, look, I'll give a special blessing to everyone who reads me. That's what the book of Revelation says. I'll give a special blessing to everyone who reads me. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Okay? Dr. Mark Hitchcock uh, is a pastor, author. Uh, he authored an excellent resource book on prophecy called The End. It's a complete overview of Bible prophecy in the end days. It's over 500 pages. It's more like an encyclopedia. Uh, but notice these facts that I pulled from him. He said 28.5% of the Old Testament are prophetic verses. 21.5% of the New Testament are prophetic verses. So altogether, we have 27% of the Bible being prophetic verses. That's over a quarter of the Bible without question is prophecy. Proving that prophecy is central to the Holy Scriptures. Amen? Dr. Charlie Dyer, uh, professor at MBI, um, which is Moody Bible Institute, uh, he said that God gave prophecy to change our hearts, not to just fill our heads with knowledge. God never predicted the future events just to satisfy our curiosity about the future. Every time God announces events that are uh, future, He includes with His predictions some practical applications for life. Aren't you glad for that? Okay? And so God's pronouncement about the future carries with them specific advice Not only for the future, but for the here and the now. And Dr. uh, Randall Price, professor of archaeology and biblical studies at Liberty University, he said, what good is it to be able to understand the seven heads in Revelation 13.1 if we don't use our own head? Right? Of what profit is it to discern the ten toes of Daniel's image if we don't move our own two feet? And what value is it to know about the great mouth that speaks lies in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, 5, unless we open our mouth and speak the truth? So, and I love this statement. Once again, pulled it from Dr. Mark Hitchcock's book. He said this, and I quote, In every generation where prophecy has been properly, and the key word is properly, okay, in every generation where prophecy has been properly proclaimed, the results have been a harvest of souls for the glory of God. Why? Because when prophecy is properly proclaimed, it is sounding the alarm. Hello? It's sounding the alarm and saying, let's reevaluate our lives and make sure we're ready to meet the Lord. Amen? So, with that as our framework, let's delve into the topic of tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, who is this beast he's talking about? Well, Revelation 13 introduces this person well known to Bible prophecy. He's actually called by at least 20 different names. Most commonly, though, referred to by the name Antichrist. Now, the term Antichrist has two meanings. Basically, it's quite simple. Notice on your worksheet. That uh, which is against Christ. That's number one. That which is against Christ. And number two, that which counterfeits and takes the place of, okay, becomes instead of Christ. Both meanings fit the bill. 
Um, the Antichrist will be against Christ. That is, he will be an enemy of Christ, and he will try to replace Christ. He will be a false Christ. So this future world leader who will be the Antichrist is called by, uh, as I mentioned, over 20 different names throughout Bible prophecy. He's called in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn. He's also called in Daniel 8, uh, the king of fierce countenance. He's called the prince that shall come. He's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the beast. Uh, he's referred to as 600, three score, and six. Okay? He's referred to as the lawless one. Now, just as Christ was the promised um, offspring of the woman, okay, going back to, is it Revelation 3.15? Okay, the first promise of the Messiah, just as Christ was the promised offspring of the woman, the Antichrist is the promised offspring of the serpent. Okay, so counterfeiting the work of God has been the work of Satan all the way back to where? That's better. Because the first time all I heard was... Okay, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The Antichrist now is going to be Satan's masterpiece. And there's been much and really too much speculation about, about the nationality of the Antichrist. Revelation 13.1. Now, this is the way I see it, okay? Revelation 13.1 tells us, indicates that he saw a beast coming out of the sea. Meaning the, uh, meaning the sea of peoples around the Mediterranean. And another place in the passage uh, in, in scripture makes me believe that's referring to a Gentile people. From that... I gather he will be a Gentile, but hang on. Daniel 8, 8, 9 suggests that he is the small horn that came out of the four Grecian horns, showing that he will be part Greek. Daniel 9, 26 refers to him as the ruler of the people that will come, meaning that he will be the, of the royal lineage of those who destroyed Jerusalem. History shows us that who destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. Okay? Therefore, he will be predominantly, I believe, Roman. Daniel eleven thirty six through 37 tells us that he regards not the God of his fathers. That still suggests, though, that he will be a Jew. In all probability, the Antichrist, I believe, will appear to be a Gentile. And like another gentleman, not a gentleman, another dictator by the name of Hitler who feared to reveal Jewish blood the Antichrist is going to keep his Jewish ancestry a secret that's what I believe and so uh, it may be known only to God but I feel the Bible teaches that he will be Roman slash Grecian Jew which represents really the people of all the earth Okay, now how can the Antichrist be identified? Here's some characteristics that I want us to notice first right out of the gate. He exalts himself above all gods. Secondly, he will sit in the temple and claim to be God. Thirdly, he will be able to do powerful supernatural things. Okay, by that we're meaning miracles. This guy is going to perform miracles. So, if you're asking yourself, I wonder if so-and-so is an antichrist. Have they performed any miracles lately? Okay, that's a huge question you can ask yourself. Have you heard lately of whoever you're thinking in your mind uh, opening blinded eyes lately? Okay, this guy is going to have supernatural power. 
Number four, he will deceive many with his cult of personality. Okay, very charisma leader. Uh, A lot of charisma and charismatic style. Five, he will sign a false peace covenant with Israel. But the church, here's my point, the church will be taken out in the rapture prior to that signing of that peace covenant. So it doesn't take much, much study to find out a few of the details, non-negotiable, unquestionable details about the Antichrist. There will only be one person who fits all the characteristics of this great deceiver who will arise at the end of the world and deceive people with supernatural signs and wonders. The Antichrist's great power will not be his own. He will work in accord with activity from, uh, from, from Satan. The Antichrist's power, signs, false wonders will not only be deceptive tricks like falsifying his own death and resurrection that is mentioned in, in our text, but also he's going to have actual manifestations of Satan's supernatural power. Miracles refer to supernatural acts and signs that point to the one who performs them. Why? Because Christ healed the blind. The Antichrist is what? Going to be able to heal the blind. You follow me so far? Okay? But obviously it's going to be through the power of the devil. Okay? Antichrist's miracles will reveal his supernatural power. It will create wonder, shock, astonishment. The Antichrist's miracle signs and wonders are false, not in the sense that they are fakery, but that they lead to false conclusions about who he is. He will really be able to work miracles, but it's through the power of the devil. And so they, those miracles is what's going to cause people to believe the lie that he is a divine being. And the Bible says all the world will bow and worship him. Okay? John saw that the Antichrist deluded followers worshiped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? The Antichrist will mislead the world with all the deception, wickedness uh, that he has at his disposal. He will muster all of evil's uh, undiluted, unrestrained, seductive power to tempt the world to give him unprecedented influence over the entire world. This power-hungry maniac will also demand to be worshipped as God. So, will Christians, the question that is asked oftentimes, will Christians be able to identify the Antichrist before the rapture? It is possible that Christians, notice on your handout, will be able to identify traits of the Antichrist, but we cannot be sure of his actual identity. The Word of God says... That the body of Christ is removed before the Antichrist signs the covenant of death, which is that false peace covenant with Israel, and that his true agenda will be hidden for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. He will be a party man. Throw in parties. Everybody will love him. He will be peace-loving. That's one reason and way he comes to power. He's not going to rise to power for the first three and a half years as a dictator. Okay? He will never win the whole world by being that way. He will rise to power for the first three and a half years as a peace-loving party man. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, part next week. Uh, But the false peace covenant with Israel and that his true agenda will be hidden until the middle of the tribulation when he is literally, the Bible says, indwelt by Satan himself. Okay? No one can really be sure who that Antichrist is until the Jews sign the false peace treaty with him after the church is removed in the rapture. I base that on 2 Thessalonians 2.7 and I base it on the fact that we are pre-trib. Or I am here. I'm so pre-trib I don't eat post-toasties. Never mind. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It is the church 
who must be taken out of the way before the Antichrist can rise to power, I believe. Ever since the Old Testament first spoke of him, Christians and Jews have been looking for the advent of the Antichrist. Daniel described him as the most evil man who will ever live. He will charm the Jews into submission. And then at that three and a half year point, he is going to turn against them. This man of sin will briefly become the most powerful man on earth. Many Christians have tried to name the Antichrist from among the men of their day. Some have made good assumptions while others are probably far off base with their observations. And of course, no one has been able to name the true Antichrist. Several different world figures have been tagged as the Antichrist through the years. Most of these men are dead. And so presumably off the hook, I guess. But a number of them uh, are still active on our world stage. Let me, let me, can I share with you a few of them that has been talked about as being the Antichrist? Uh, one of the very early ones was Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the one uh, of only a few pre-Christ candidates. Okay, and is described by scholars as being a perfect type of Antichrist. Epiphanes was predicted by Daniel the prophet, and he fulfilled many of the prophecies that the real Antichrist will repeat. Uh, For example, um, called the abomination of desolation when he offers a pig, a swine, in the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes actually did that. Okay, okay. And so uh, we find that he was a very, you know, apt foreshadow. Uh, Another one, moving on forward. Let's go forward. Uh, Roman Emperor Nero. He was one of the first and one of the greatest persons to fit the role of the Antichrist. He put many, many, many Christians to death and even killed members of his own family. Nero's actions actually helped the church, the Bible says, or actually history says, rather, um, to multiply faster, okay, it separated persecution, as we know, always separates what? The men from the boys, spiritually, so to speak. And so when, we, when he learned that uh, the Roman Senate was plotting against him, uh, he poisoned himself and died. Okay, so obviously he wasn't the Antichrist. Um, the Pope, a lot of folks, uh, just about every Pope, Uh, has been given the title of the Antichrist. Uh, He's a favorite uh, among some evangelicals. During the Middle Ages, when the power of the Pope was more pronounced, uh, the title was more plausible. But today, the political power of the Pope, um, although still a powerful figure, don't get me wrong, but but, uh, the political power, to somewhat degree, has waned. Uh, It's more likely as some Bible teachers may believe, the Pope may play a role. And uh, some have talked about uh, the Catholic Church or the Pope as uh, playing a role of the false prophet and such. Um, I don't know. It's not mentioned in Scripture. Uh, There is a lot of, uh, like I said, assumptions and some speculations and some uh, pretty, you know, uh, good reasoning that many go on. Next, Charlemagne. He lived 742 to about 814 A.D., uh, controlled much of Central Europe. Charlemagne put himself into the shoes of the Antichrist by trying to rebuild the Roman Empire. Okay, we know the Antichrist is going to arise out of a uh, 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 rebuilt Roman Empire. Uh, and, and Charlemagne put himself, he tried to do that, but really the only, only the real Antichrist is going to be able to accomplish that. Um, Charlemagne obviously died before he achieved that goal. Napoleon is another one. Uh, the self-crowned French emperor was not particularly, uh, some say, a depraved man, but he did he, uh, he did not persecute the church, and, but he lacked a number of, of qualities needed um, for the role of the Antichrist. His downfall was that he loved war too much. Uh, Napoleon, like Charlemagne, worked at reviving the Roman Empire. Okay, uh, so that was a few of the old, old, old ones. Now, as you let's take a huge leap and jump up more into uh, 
relative history of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, the numerical number of FDR's name was reported to add up to what? 666. And, and, and you say, how does that happen? Let me, let me give you a real quick summary. The Bible tells us, calculate the number of the beast. For the number of that, uh, the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Now, if you don't know how the Hebrew uh, Gemetria system of math works, here's a quick summary. The values 1 through 9, okay, are assigned to the first nine letters of the alphabet. 10 through 90 are for the next nine letters. And 100 through 400 for the last four letters. They ha- only have 22 characters in their alphabet. Hebrew we're talking about. Okay. Um, using this system of math and applying it to the first 22 characters of the English alphabet, they always make the last four letters of our English alphabet equate to zero. They then calculate names in English, just as you can calculate names in Hebrew. So there is a man on the world scene whose name and title calculates to 666 in both Hebrew and English, is what uh, many of them are trying to prove. Okay, and so they did that juggling with Franklin uh, Roosevelt. And because of the Great Depression, FDR was the most... Uh, autocratic U.S. president in the 20th century. Roosevelt was in office 12 years, okay, the only president to do that. So many eyebrows were raised and rumors were many, okay, that he was going to be the man. Next, Mussolini, because he became the dictator of Italy and uh, original capital of the Roman Empire, he was the subject of a great deal of commentary. During the rule of, uh, from 1922 to 43, his extreme arrogance fit the role of the Antichrist, but, but his military capabilities were laughable. Um, Italy needed help from Germany all throughout World War II, and so uh, that's Mussolini, Adolf Hitler. Most people would describe this man as the most infamous, infam, infamous man that ever lived. He, he remains a demonic forewarning, uh, no doubt, of what the real Antichrist will be. Uh, Joseph Stalin, the Russian dictator, is believed to be the greatest mass murderer of all time, having killed 30 million people. Most of history's tyrants killed foreigners, but Stalin specialized in killing his own citizens. And so he was thought of by some to be the Antichrist. And then even coming on down, uh, John F. Kennedy Check this out. As the nation's first Roman Catholic president, John F. Kennedy was believed to do the Pope's bidding. Uh, Many say at the uh, 1956 Democratic Convention, he received how many votes? 666. So when Kennedy, they said, was shot dead in Dallas, several people waited for his deadly wound to heal. No joke. They thought it would happen. It never happened. King Juan Carlos of Spain, the late prophecy teacher Charles uh, Taylor was a big proponent of the idea that Carlos is the Antichrist because of his bloodline and because he's the king of the tenth nation that is to join the European Union. Um, even, Even Ronald Reagan, during the 80s when he was president, there was talk going around about the fact that he had six letters in all three of his names. So there they have it. Uh, Michael Gorbachev, uh, the first Russian leader to support the rights of the people, has has been and remains in uh, many's eyes the candidate for the job of the Antichrist, uh, according to many. Uh, So until he dies, some prophecy watchers are going to keep their eyes on him. I guess being born with that mark on his head was too obvious for some. Some, uh, some uh, look at, uh, well, used to, uh, Sun Young Moon, the leader of the Unification Church, openly claimed to be the Messiah. Before he died, though, he was sent to jail for tax evasion. Uh, it's interesting that Christ, by, you know, Christ had a tax collector on his staff. He didn't suffer from tax problems. So you pick the smarter Messiah. 
former PLO leader, Yasser Arafat. Now, this one's interesting. When Arafat signed the peace treaty with Israel, if you recall, back in 1993, okay, some thought that he was bringing to pass the prophecy regarding the Antichrist signing the seven-year peace treaty with Israel. And now where we're at in history, in order for that to have been the case, he would have, uh, we would all have lived through the tribulation and we would be well into the millennial reign. Uh, so there's, there's a few. Louis Farrakhan, um, it even goes to Bill Gates. I guess if the beast needs to be a computer illiterate, uh, financially well off, then they say Bill Gates is the candidate. Um, Prince Charles of Wales, many, uh, many have worked that numerology out with his name, and, and they believe his ancestry links back to the Roman Empire, and, and uh, it's reported that he's a vegetarian, so that explains why the Antichrist will stop the daily animal sacrifices in the Jewish temple. Are you getting all this? I'm talking about a lot of speculation, right? And now let me give you one more, Barack Obama. 44th president generated a great deal of interest in what possible connections he has to Bible prophecy. Dozens of emails pointed out the odd fact that the day after his election, the daily pick three lottery number in Obama's home state of Illinois was 666. So, there you have it. Lots of speculation. Let me say, I have observation of my own about the Antichrist. First of all, I have no idea who he is. When you examine history, it's interesting to note that people who became well-known on the world stage often have been largely unknown before they became famous. Hitler was a good example of that. Before he ruled much of Europe, at one low point, he was living in a in a a cheap motel. Okay, you would you would you walked by him, you would never have guessed he would someday threaten to take over the world. When the time for the Antichrist comes, he will achieve great power. But right now, he could be out flipping hamburgers. Hello. We don't know. Only after the rapture of the church will the identity, I believe, of the Antichrist be revealed. In other words, church, you don't want to know who he is. Because if you know who he is, that means you've been what? Left behind. Huh? Follow me? And if you've been left behind, that's not a good deal. So, nothing is more futile than trying to identify the Antichrist before the rapture. Doing so would be an effort to prove the Bible wrong. That, was never, that has never happened. It's not going to happen now. So, all anyone does by trying to identify the Antichrist before the church is taken out is embarrass themselves and bring criticism upon other Christians. In connection with this, let me hasten to add that 666 is the Antichrist number. It is not my driver's license number, my credit card number, social security number, any other number associated with me. It's not any of your numbers. It is his number, one specific number that identifies one specific individual. Okay? We do not know whether or not, like I said, even if he's already alive as a person, it seems reasonable that he will have to be full full grown when he appears. And if the rapture is as close as the prophetic authorities believe, it makes sense to assume that he is already alive, already grown. The thing to remember is that nobody knows at all. Uh, And so we can only speculate. And so uh, when somebody starts, you know, that shop talk at the workplace or whatever, do you believe so-and-so is the Antichrist? I hope not. I need to be out of here. Huh? But someday he will rise to power. And he's going to arise to power 
around the framework, not of war, but of what? Peace. For three and a half years. But at the end of three and a half years, he's going to turn towards war, embrace war, and destroy more human beings than anyone who has ever lived. More on those details next week. We don't have the time. But in, in conclusion, I, I want us to approach Revelation. I, I don't, don't want us to focus too much, too much. I want us to focus some, but I don't want us to focus too much on the Antichrist that we forget where our true hope lies. Our true hope lies in who? The real Christ. Praise God. So any news about the, quote, man of sin should only prepare us to look for the man of salvation. And as, a, as I mentioned, as a pre-tribulationist, I personally have no plans to meet the Antichrist. No plans to meet this son of perdition, as the Bible calls him. Only those who have not repented and are not living pure lives should expect to meet him or more likely see him on CNN or Fox or whatever. And though this Antichrist has the power of Satan behind him and endeavors to rule through fear, through intimidation, and the Bible says, for a time, it will look like he's got the upper hand. Right? For a time. But be sure, church, his doom is foretold. Our confidence is built on the solid rock of the true Jesus Christ. The fate of the Antichrist is spelled out in Scripture where it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, And then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Spirit there means breath. You think the Antichrist is going to be powerful? Where when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he's just going to go, Whoo! Hello? And the Antichrist is going to be gone. He says, Be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with just the brightness of his coming. Wow. Wow. Thank God I'm going to embrace the true Christ. Praise God. So this confidence is reflected. I, I like to think of it this way as our musicians come. Um, reflected in the great hymn. Was it Martin Luther that wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God? I believe it was him. I'm not sure. But notice this, what he said. <laughs> Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Saboeth is his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devil's field should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his true his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Now, I know that's old English, but I think we get, we get the point, right? Stand and let's worship the Lord. Folks, we read the back of the book and we win. Right? I said, we win. Hallelujah. Why don't you just give God the praise? Aren't you glad you know Him tonight? Aren't you glad He's got the power, amen, over the enemy? Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your breath. Lord, the brightness of your coming. Oh, hallelujah. I believe we're living in that time of just a countdown to Satan's lockdown. Hallelujah. It's all going to be over after a while. Amen. Amen. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Touch our hearts tonight. Encourage us, Lord, as we focus on the future of the church of Jesus Christ, which is a bright future. 
In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Mm -hmm. We've got the power in the name of Jesus. Oh, we've got the power in the name of the Lord. And though Satan rages, we will not be defeated. Oh, we've got the power in the name. Sing it one more time. Hallelujah. Oh, we've got the power in the name of Jesus. We've got the power. In the name of the Lord, though Satan rages, we will not be defeated. Because we've got the power in the name of the Lord. Altars are always open if you want to spend a few moments in prayer. We'll pray with you. We never turn the lights out on anybody praying. You take your time. Otherwise, God bless you. Shake somebody's hand and tell them, I'm looking for the Christ, not the Antichrist. Amen? I'm looking for Christ, not the Antichrist. God bless you. We've got the power in the name of Jesus. We've got the power in the name of the Lord.